out a little thing about um, value adding to uh, vegetables through live fermentation. That's one of the outcomes of my SARE grant. And uh, just a quick hand, who has done some fermenting? Okay, it's it's a hot topic. Like, like Joan said, I'm no Sandor cat, okay? Just, he's not here, is he? Okay. All right. Um, but yeah, you know, this is kind of like the Bible for me. Um, the reason I'm gonna I'm gonna go through this real quick, and then I have all this food up here for you guys to eat. I know lunch is right after this, so uh, you know I want to have some fun here today. Uh, here's some pickles. I'm assuming some of you folks are growing vegetables. Okay, so we actually I I'm primarily like the pawpaw guy. They that's how I got started. And then we got into goats because animals don't eat pawpaw trees. And, and, and then we got a high tunnel and then we were growing all these vegetables and that's how I got into fermentation. And let's see here. So you guys probably know that live fermentation is this ancient tradition around the world where people preserve vegetables. It's, it's no rocket science. It's pretty easy really after you get the basics down. What, what we do is we've had, we have a facility where we're inspected by the Ohio Department of Agriculture for cheese production. So, you know, I'm used to jumping through the hoops of the ODA, and I was like, I saw this as another opportunity to jump through some hoops and uh, learn how to bring a product to market. Um, it's all about these lactic acid producing bacteria, and when that bacteria is working on your vegetables, it's lowering the pH. And that's your food safety uh, control point that you have to keep an eye on. So, and that's it. I mean, it's pretty basic. Um, obviously, sauerkraut, pickles, kimchi are some of the, the ones that you might have heard of, some of the fermented stuff. We, we've done some experimenting up here. You guys can come up there and sample and uh, tell me what you think. So yeah, here's some, uh, some rough looking vegetables, but you can actually, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter what they look like, you're going to chop them up and ferment them. So that's one of the biggest benefits of fermenting is that, say you didn't sell it at the market, or say you don't have a market, and instead of it just rotting or you feed it to the hogs or put it in your compost pile, you can get a recipe, do a little bit of processing, and uh, you're making a preserved product that you can sell later for actually more money. Uh, so yeah, that's it goes from that raw product into a little package, and so you can sell it at a store. We we primarily sell all our stuff. We're from the Athens area, and uh, sell mostly at our farmers market. But we do have a couple retail accounts in Athens. So yeah, your value adding to your vegetables, and I've been a big pro you know, promoter of this value adding concept because. You want to make money, you want to survive. 
And uh, I mean, obviously you love what you're doing, and that's there's value to that, but you want to pay the bills. So this is a way to take up something that maybe you could sell for a dollar and turn it into something you could sell for three to four dollars. And again, preserving your vegetables. If you're unable to sell all your fresh vegetables, this is a great opportunity for you. And then get a good recipe, you're obviously you're, you're working towards uh, uh, something that tastes good and uh, people like what you're making, but you have happy customers and they're going to come back and buy some more unless they get into fermenting at home. Which is um, you guys probably heard about all the uh, health benefits of fermentation. That lactic acid bacteria is like your probiotic in your gut and like your immune system a lot of it is in your intestinal tract, and, and so when you're you're going to be able to absorb the nutrients in your food when it's partially digested by this bacteria, and so you're, you're getting more nutritional value for less energy, and uh, it's a good thing. I I kind of have enjoyed doing it because it's kind of a creative opportunity to um, you know expand our business. That's that's the way I looked at it, and. Uh, I've learned a lot, and it's it's definitely interesting stuff. You know, it's like when you when I show up at the market, people are like, what's that smell? You know, it's like what's that rotten smell? You know, it's like <laughs> it's like kim cheese. You know what I mean? And stuff like that. And you sell it to people, and they say, yeah, I put that in my fridge, and man, it's stinky. My wife calls it the dragon line of fermented foods. You know, like if you start eating it, you know, you're just if you've been eating fermented foods today. So you got to make sure that you know, you're sharing your food with your loved one. Um, and again, the maximizing the value of our assets are, uh, we have the kitchen. So it's like, I'm going to use our kitchen as much as we can. And uh, you have your food safety permit, and you can get other permits. And all you need for fermentation is a food safety permit, which is like 75 or 50 bucks a year in Ohio, pretty cheap. Uh, this is uh, one of our helpers, Badger. I thought somebody might know Badger. Um, he doesn't have his beard net on there. Um, so this was, I didn't want to put this picture on there, but I only had Badger without his beard net. But, uh, Badger's been coming out and helping us do some packaging of you know, the fermented foods. Here's our high tunnel, and I just took this picture yesterday, so it's kind of we're in our downtime. But we had a bunch of the daikons we grew in there for kimchi. The uh, Napa cabbage, we had some beets, carrots, which we put in our um, uh, root kimchi. And, but also, if you don't have a high tunnel, obviously your garden is your source of your vegetables. Or you can buy them from people. Maybe it's cheaper for you to buy stuff from other people, uh, depending on how busy you are. So this is kind of showing, we're kind of prepping the, the pickles. So we, we put we put our pickles in these kind of jars, and we, these are re, reusable. So we charge a dollar deposit on these jars. And the people in Athens kind of like that, right? You know, uh, and we sell them to them basically for a dollar. If they don't bring them back, then you know we're not out anything. But a lot of people will bring them back, and then, and we actually at some of the uh, retail accounts we have too, they 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 work that system, so we're not producing a bunch of plastic waste. Uh, grape grape leaves, oak leaves. These are things that we get off our farm that when you put them in your uh, your pickles, they actually keep them firm, and that's that's kind of a neat agroforestry kind of thing. So yeah, we got started because there was a gal that was working for us, her name's Kelly Shaw, and she was milking goats for us, and she had worked on garden. She was mostly in the gardening, but she wanted to get out on a farm, and we had dairy, we needed help with dairy. And so we kind of took her interest and, and she started working in the gardens and growing the fermented foods and starting this whole process. And it turned into a, a full-time job for her then, because then not only was she milking the goats, but she was working in the gardens and then doing the, uh, the kitchen, some of the kitchen work with the fermented stuff. It utilized our facility again. You put all this money into your infrastructure. You want to try to maximize the use of that. And uh, we learned a lot. We did a lot of experimenting, and through this uh, grant, we were able to do even more experimenting. Um, most of the time, things work, but occasionally things don't work out. And then, uh, like, we liked having those added things at our farmers market booth. We we sell like pawpaw stuff. We sell um, our cheese. 
lot of people are going vegan, so this kind of worked out where we were like, we had, you know, just actually cheese is one of our biggest sellers. Um, this is an option for uh, vegan people, or, you know, it, like, like Joan said, it's a hot item, so the kids at OU are excited about it. And added value to our vegetables. And that's all we actually did. We didn't grow vegetables to sell vegetables, we grew vegetables to ferment. Uh, so, does anybody here have a facility? Okay. Don't be intimidated about getting a facility, okay? Some of the basic things are here in this picture. You have to have a sink to wash your dishes. You have to have a hand wash sink. Uh, cleanable, wipeable surfaces. Lights, so you can see what you're doing. And that's pretty much it. Get water source. If you are not on public water, you have to have your water tested. We're on public water, so that makes it easy. Not that that water is good, so let me say that. Um, it's not my favorite. So, uh, if you make this investment into a facility, you're going to be able to do a lot of value adding, which if you look at who's making the money, I think a lot of the, the processors of, that, of agricultural products are making the money. So, yeah. um, you might be able to do a home kitchen as long as you say on your label, this is a home product. Then you'd be inspected by the, your local health department instead. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, his question or statement was more about uh, a lot of the requirements of producing in, in a home. And I actually don't have a lot of background on that. In Athens, we have this great shared use kitchen called AceNet. So when I started doing like our pop-off processing, I worked down there. And then when we started making cheese, we upgraded this building to, to make it a you know an ODA inspected facility. But I actually don't have a lot of experience with home processing. But I, uh, he mentioned that you might not be able to have pets in your home and things like that. But hey, if, it's, if you really want to do it, you know, kick the dog out. Of <laughs> Now, I just wanted to add, I do baking out of my house in under Ohio. I'm uh, classified as a, <clears throat> excuse me, a cottage business. So I'm allowed to sell a certain variety of products within the state of Ohio. Once you get into um, what they call highly perishable foods or, or, you know, cheesecakes, things like that, then you need, if you're going to do it in your home, then, yeah, there's no pets, you need inspections and all the other. But if you go to the uh, Ohio site for that, a lot of information. Okay, so the, I'm going to repeat the gist of that is that you can get a cottage industry license, and there's certain products that are in that license category, uh, but you need to find out more about that by going to probably the Ohio, the Ohio Department of Ag's website. Um, hey, and I would encourage you to always have a good relationship with your inspectors. No, seriously. I mean, it's, it's, if you have this mentality that these people are trying to put me out of business, they're not. You know, they're actually here to help you produce a safe product so you don't go to jail or someone doesn't die. Okay? So I've always had a great relationship with our inspectors. And you, know, you call them up. You say, hey, I want to do this. What do I have? What are the hoops I have to jump through? And you know, I've, they've been very easy to work with. And they're, they're working for you. They get paid by the state and our, our tax dollars. So, uh, yeah, you'll get inspected every year. Um, the ODA guys come down. I have a food safety inspector, but then I also have a dairy inspector. And, and you know, after we've been through the dairy stuff, we get inspected every month. Our milk gets tested every month. Our cheese gets tested every month. Um, they'll show up. They'll look through all your records. And as long as you're you know, doing your due diligence to record what's going on and your, keep your facility clean, you shouldn't have any problems. And uh, the basic thing about fermentation, though, is like I mentioned earlier, was the pH. Um, and, and actually with cheese, it's the same thing. You're, you're lowering the pH, and uh, does anyone here have a pH? Okay. They're not expensive. Um, you can get them online. Got some pictures of ours here. There they are. There's two different versions we've used. Uh, the one on the left 
is the one that we started with, and we switched to this other, other variety recently. Uh, it's really important to do the calibration. There's the calibration chemicals in there. Um, if you'll have a version for a 4 pH or a 7. Since we're trying to get below like a 4.4 pH, that's, you're going to use the 4, which is that pink liquid there. So you, you'll put your, your test on the bottom of your pH meter and that pink stuff, you press this button, does this little calibration thing, and then you know, you're, you're zeroed in to correctly uh, being able to test your pH. Are there The question was, is, are there specific pH meters that are approved by OVA? Haven't had that conversation. Um, they've never said anything about ours. There are a lot of different varieties of pH meters. You can spend, like these are around a hundred and some dollars, but you can spend a lot more if you want. So, yes? Um, with regulations, do you have to worry about your pH being below four and your instrument not calibrated below four? Um, well, you're going to calibrate your your meter at that that solution of which is four. Right, but if your pH is three five, you're good. Yeah. Okay. You're, 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 they're not that picky about it. Well, you just want to be lower than four point four. Okay. And if you're lower, you're better. You know, but, but you want to, you know, that gets into your flavors, like how sour do you want your stuff. Um. But was. Why is the why is the pH so important? It's uh, food safety. Uh, it's E. coli does not grow <clears throat> below 4.4, and that's the thing that's going to kill people. So if if you get it, if you're into this value added stuff, the, the little bit of food science you need, and I am no food scientist, okay, but well, you just you are now. Really well, I mean, I guess I kind of am, but you know, it's the, the critical control point they call it. Um, HACCP plans, hazardous. What's that? Analysis. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of stuff you need to get into. Um, and we have ACENET, Athens, or the Appalachian Center for Economic Networks, where I kind of learned a lot of this stuff, and they encourage you to go to these workshops where you learn about this stuff. I've been in this for many years now, so I did that a long time ago. Um, my wife's making the goat cheese, and like she's developing a HACCP plan now for our facility. Um, there's always more to do. Um, but the gist of it is, E. coli is not going to grow above 4.4, and that's it. You know, that's the main thing you're worried about. Oh, sorry, below 4.4. Any other questions? Moving on. Uh, one of the most important things, though, is you need to keep records. And it doesn't have to be fancy records. You just have to have something that you can show your inspectors that you collected your critical control point data. And so, we have to collect different things for the, uh, you know, the cheese production, and it's not super high tech or anything like that. It's just a little file, you know, that they can come and look at. Right. Yep, you're doing it. Okay, no one's died. We haven't heard any trouble, so we're moving on. Uh, this is our license for frozen foods because that's one of the things we do with the pawpaws. But you got to have your food safety permit first. That's I think like 50 bucks a year, depending on the size of your facility. And then whatever else you might do in your facility, you, you might need another, another permit for that. Like at ACENET, they have a baker, bakery license, they have a canning license, they have a meat processing license, a seafood processing license, and all this stuff. And they, the ACENET works with the, the firms that are down there to get these licenses to learn all the ropes about um, the laws about your process. But, I mean, seriously, if you guys can uh, you know, fill out paperwork and you know, pay attention to a few key details. You can do this stuff. It's not rocket science. You got to have this basic stuff around your facility and like scale, food processors. We, this is our walk in cooler. Uh, so, again, we're trying to maximize. We have all this stuff for cheese. We do other stuff. So, hey, why not use it for, why don't we do, make some more stuff? Use, use our facility more. So, you want to make some fermented stuff, you need a recipe and plan. And uh, obviously some of you people have done this before, and you might have had a, some recipes you like better than others. 
So keeping track of your recipes, you know, fine-tuning your process and your recipe down where, hey, this is really nice, I like it. That's, that's kind of where we're at right now because we've done a lot of experimenting, but we kind of want to get down to where we've got our five or so products that are going to try. We're trying to kind of commercialize a little bit, so we want to have a standardized product. And you need, you need somebody who's going to pay attention to the details. So, um, let's see. The, the thing about when you're processing, like say you're making pickles, okay? You're going you're gonna to wash your pickles. And, and there's a recipe on the back of that little flyer brochure I gave you. You're going to wash them. You're going to put them in a bucket. You're going to pour brine in the bucket. And then you're going to weight the material so it's below the brine. And I have some pictures here coming up. But basically, you're going to have it at room temperature for about five to seven days. It could be a little longer. Um, and that's where that, that bacteria is working at room temperature. And if it's too cold, it's going to take longer. And if it's really warm, it might be faster. So what we'll do is we'll be monitoring the temperature of our um, place where we're, we'll have some pictures here, um, where uh, they're, they're at room temperature. And when they're done, I mean, we're going to be checking the pH every day or two. And then when they get below that 4.0, 4.4, if we're happy with the flavor and stuff, or we might let it go a little bit longer, uh, then we just take the, uh, the weights off and everything else, put a lid on it, and put it in the cooler and store it, and then it's kind of stable at that point. Can you do those little paper, paper strips to do the pH testing? So it's like, I know it's like cool. Yeah, the question was, is can you use those pH strips? And I don't think that that's going to be sufficient for what you need. You know, it's spend a hundred bucks, get the pH. Well, like, if, I just wanted to do this as a hobby, like, if you want to do it as a hobby at home, you don't really even need a pH meter. Uh -huh. I mean, because you're going to taste it. And if it tastes really nasty, don't eat it. You know? <laughs> uh, if, it, if it tastes like you think it should, you know, then you're OK. I mean, so it's kind of like a foolproof method as far as if, if it's going bad, you're going to know. So, and you'll be able to see the bubbles. It's fermenting if you have it in a glass jar. Um, Real quick, with regards to the brine, um, do you ever um, recommend heating the brine to encourage the dissolving of any salts or sugars involved in that? And if so, what temperature do you recommend the brine to be added to the question? Okay, the question was, is, do I ever heat the water in our brine? And no, I don't. Okay. We never heat the water in the brine. The main thing about the brine is you want to dissolve that salt because you could layer in salt in with your, your, your vegetables, but then it's not going to be distributed equally around. So that's why you want to dissolve it in the water so that when it's in there, it's going to get everywhere. So that's the key about that. Um, this is showing uh, how we're checking the pH of, of one of the products we make called Cacduki not to be confused with cat dookie. Um, that's one of my marketing like, lines. Uh, so yeah, you can see how, all right, 3.76, check, it's safe, we're putting it in the cooler. Just that simple. This is really simple stuff. So those are all different batches? Yeah, we were doing uh, big, ba we were doing like big batches of stuff. So you don't try to get the same product at the same pH level? Uh, well, if you want to do super big batches, you can do that, but we, we mostly focus on like a five gallon bucket size, and so that's worked for us. No one's ever said, wow, this is so different than the last batch. I mean, it's pretty close. So I didn't repeat the question on that, sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, on your buckets, now, do you use like an airlock combination, or you just let it breathe freely? Well, I got a picture here coming up okay. about our buckets. Um, this is a recipe kind of thing where we had we keep we keep our batch numbers and we'll put that on our label of our buckets and so that batch would be the date that we made it um, and then just some of those detailed questions you want to be asking like and this is for pickles here like how many pounds of pickles how many grape leaves um, we've has anybody ever heard of spice bush okay. We use spice bush because we're into like non-native forest crops and stuff, or sorry, non-timber forest products and native crops. 
Um, we use the spice bush berries instead of pepper for a lot of times. Um, so you'll see we wrote spice bush down on a couple of these. And, and then you'll see the date. We packed it, we checked the pH, and put it into the uh, cooler. So you, again, it's just like record keeping stuff. But that's really important when your inspector shows up. These are some food processing uh, tools that we got partially through our SARA grant. And uh, the, this one right here, the, the big tube looking thing, is a root peeler. Pretty neat little thing. You can put like 20 pounds of roots in there, and in like five minutes, they're washed and peeled. Um, so we, we really have gotten into this thing called a root kimchi. So when you've got like Jerusalem artichokes and carrots and daikon radishes, I mean, that was really killing us as far as labor. Um, this thing's awesome. So if you ever want to try it out, let me know, because it's sit, sitting around most of the time. Yes, it's it's like a, the question was is it a peeler or is it a tumbler and it's a tumbler there's water that flows through it the whole time and that chamber there that little tube on the bottom is where the waste comes out that black tube and then the uh, that chamber thing opens up and they just they just fall out and they're, they're pretty much clean yes ma'am The question was, is why do we like to peel them instead of use the whole thing? And this is basically a labor saver. Um, I mean, because we could scrub them all down, but man, with those roots, there's just a lot of potential contamination, and you want to get all that dirt off of there. Like, especially something like a Jerusalem artichoke, it's, it's a nightmare, you know, because there's just little nooks and crannies everywhere. The thing next to it is basically like, uh, it's a motor that spins stuff, and you can put different attachments on it. So we can slice and grind and all these different things. And again, th these are the kind of things that after you do it by hand, and you're paying somebody a decent wage to do it, you're like, wow, we're not going to make any money doing this. And so like, you've got to invest in some equipment if you want to make money. OK, so this is our high tech, uh, how we weight things down. So we got our bucket, we put the stuff in the bucket. We put a plate on top of the stuff. <laughs> we put a, like a five gallon, I mean a gallon glass jug. Sometimes we'll, we'll use different size weights or different type, but usually it's a glass jar with water in it. And then we put, the white stuff is like a cheesecloth. Um, that's some of the, we, we use a cheese, it's called cheese bandage. It's like a plastic cheesecloth that we use for cheese production, but it's pretty more, it's a lot more durable and cleanable than the traditional cheesecloth. And then the string, you just tie it around. And so that's what you wind up with is just a bucket with the plate weighted down with that cheesecloth around to protect it. Because what's going on is when we do a lot of our fermenting is in the fall or like in the summer. So there's bugs out. So if you don't keep that thing down, you know, you might have a fruit fly or something like that. So that helps protect your product from contamination. Yes, sir. The question was about, um, he had heard about the cheesecloth being underneath the plate. And I've never done it that way. Uh, sounds completely plausible if you wanted to try it, um, but I, I've never done it that way. Is there, do you keep it open like that? Do you like the air getting into it like that? Or could you use, like, I'm just thinking, you know, like a smaller weight to put the top on it? OK, the question was about why do we leave it open like that? And could we do it a different way? And the answer is we do do it in different ways, but we always have the cheesecloth on the top. Um, you want to have air being able. You don't want to have a sealed top. You just want to have your your fermented product underneath the brine. That's the key. I think you want to develop a aerobic bacteria, not the anaerobic. Bacteria. Absolutely, anaerobic is not not good, not tasty. So here's. What we do is we stick them on these shelves like this, 
And uh, I, I put the heater in there to show you that sometimes you might want to be controlling the temperature. And then you can't really see it, but there's this little thing right here is, it, well, um, there's a little thermometer up there, where that little square thing, where you're, you're basically, you're keeping track of your temperature that your ferment's at. Um, if your outside temperature, you know, if it's cold and it's harder to heat your facility, it'll just take longer to do your ferment. And in, unless you're in a big hurry, that's no big deal. Just gotta keep an eye on it. So do you care about the temperature at all? Uh, the question was, does ODA care about temperature, or do they just care about pH? And the answer is, they just care about pH. So, yes? The grape leaves, you just go out and get uh, wild harvest grape leaves? Or? The question is about grape leaves. Where do we get our grape leaves? And uh, we just get them from any grapevine. There are no special grapevines, um, just any vines grandma growing in a tree. It's a nice reason to take a hike and go collect a few oak leaves. We just use them in the pickles and the, uh, the dilly beans. We'll use them in, the, in, in those too. Yes, ma'am. For the grape leaves, you said oak leaves too. You just wash them and put them in the brine like a bay leaf? Okay, the question was about oak leaves and grape leaves and about what do we do to them and we just wash them and put them in there. So I, I found that the oak leaves are really good at producing a crisp uh, pickle. So, and it's you know it's an ancient tradition, I think. Yes. Okay. The question was about. Are we, is this the same room that we do the processing in? And how is our facility laid out? And the answer is, is that this is really not in our main, what we call our make room. This is in a, kind of like a hallway back to our walk-in cooler. So this was just like a spot off to the side and it's all cleanable and wipeable surfaces. So our whole facility's kind of got the stuff that we need. And, uh, <laughs> You know, when we started doing this, our our inspector, he knew nothing about this stuff. And I actually worked with him and we got educated together. And uh, they haven't heard any problems and ha we haven't had any problems. So they were like, well, you're doing everything right. Just keep it up. So in the, uh, this is what basically what you wind up with in your walk-in cooler. This is what we're winding up with is a bunch of five gallon buckets with lids. And so what's going on is, uh, there might be a plate on top of the pickles that keeps them below the brine, and then we just put a lid on the top, and then they just sit in there until you take them out and package them up. Yes? Um, you mentioned about how it is an ancient method of preservation. Do you know what people did if you, if you just left it at room temperature like somebody might have done before refrigeration? Is it just because it's just a stable point, or does it just keep getting more sour and people just eat them you know, at a less delicious level of sourness? The question was about this being an ancient tradition, how did ancient peoples utilize, uh, they didn't have a walk-in cooler to put their stuff in, what did they do? Well, it's a lot like cheese, as far as you would put it in a cave, or you would put it in some place like a root cellar that's cold. This temp, like the temperature we keep our cooler at is a little colder than like we keep our cheese at when it's aging. So yeah, basically if it was a little warmer, it would just keep working and keep souring, and it might not last as long, maybe. But if you're if you're hungry and you're eating it, I mean, it's disappearing, hopefully. Yes? What's the critical temperature point to stop the fermentation? The question is, what is the critical temperature to stop the fermentation? And I would say uh, 40, you're, you're looking at what is your cooler temperature, and like it's like about 33 to 40 is where you're slowing it down a lot. I mean, it's still probably fermenting, but I've had stuff that has been in the cooler for over a year and a half, you know, and you take it out, it's still crispy and great. So, yes? Are the rules about, like, the best buy or sell by date, or how do you determine that? The question was about best buy date or sell by date. And 
we actually haven't had any issues with stuff going bad on the shelf. Um, because it's, as long as you've got enough brine in the top, well, I actually, I'll show you some pictures of some problems that we have had, or, but really it's the stuff, uh, let me show you some pictures on that. Um, most of the time you're not going to have any problems, but you, you can run into a problem. So mostly you stick it on the shelf and it's good. Right. Refrigerated shelf, yes. Yeah. Are you legally required to stick a Best by Date on the product? No one, the question was, are we legally required to put a sell by date? And that conversation has never come up with my inspector and myself. Yes? Best by dates and sell by dates are regulated. That's just something the company puts on for themselves. That's why it's not actually safe. This gentleman's comment is that the best buy or sell by dates are not regulated by the ODA and it's just something that a company might do to ensure the best uh, product for their customers. Any other questions? Um, we get our buckets, like I get them from Lowe's. They have BPA free buckets um, and they're just, it's just convenient and they have them. Um, but you could get pallets of them, you know, from different suppliers. So it doesn't have to be a food grade bucket. Um, well, they are food grade buckets. There's like you've got different color buckets. The white, and they're all made with the same plastic. But the white buckets, the the uh, tan buckets, and one other color. I called the company, and they said basically it's all made with the same plastic. We had to just pay money to the FDA to get these ones approved. We've only approved these three colors, and so we try to always use the white buckets that say BPA free. But occasionally, when we if we, we're running out of buckets and we don't and they don't have any more at the store, sometimes we we'll use another colored bucket. There's, you'll see like there's a blue bucket in there. Um, you don't want to use the different colored buckets. So ideally, you plan ahead and you have plenty of supplies to not run out. Okay, so a lot of people have heard about a lot of vegetables that you ferment and. You know, when we were researching this stuff, we didn't really see a lot about tomatoes because they're a high acid food. But the tomatoes have worked out really well for us. And uh, so I wanted to show you how, how well they hold up. And we've got a salsa up here that I want you to try. So what we do is we do like peppers, garlic, and onions in one brine. And then we do the tomatoes in another brine. And then we'll take them out, do a little bit of food prep with that food processor, and make salsa like that. So yeah, these are, uh, this is our table at the farmer's market. And we've got like four different kimchis right now. We've got this beet green um, daikon kimchi, which is a little milder. Then we've got your more traditional kimchi, which is a little spicier with the napa cabbage and the daikon. Then we've got the root kimchi, which is Jerusalem artichokes, ginger, ginger uh, um, carrots, beets, and daikons. So that's another. It's just that one's a little more gingery for us. And then we've got the cac dookie, which is a milder version of kimchi, uh, another Korean recipe. And then we've got a salsa there. We've got these uh, these sweet spicy beets, which we we didn't use the purple beets. We use the, the white beets kind of because the purple beets, we kept having some issues with them. They get this like um, mold on the top. And, and so we tried this other version. You guys check these out. They're kind of weird. You know, you might like them. Some people like them. Um, then we got the dilly beans and the cucumbers. And we've done, let's see, I also bought, brought a sriracha sauce. We've done a bunch of different sriracha sauces. Peppers, you know, like doing straight up peppers and garlic and onions. We, we did those together. Here's our farm logo. And like I said, we started with pawpaws. We got into goats. And that's like our whole thing that we're working on. With uh, The goats don't eat the pawpaw trees. They eat everything else. And then they fertilize the soil. And... Has anyone been to the pawpaw festival? 
hey, you gotta come down, put it on your calendar mid-September. This year, Joel Salatin's coming to speak on Sunday. And I'm really excited about that. Um, last year, we drank 73 kegs of Paw Paw beer, all made at um, Ohio microbreweries. Lots, all the food vendors have like uh, Paw Paw dishes. We have a lot of educational things. You can check out our website, ohiopawpawfest.com. Uh, the pawpaw is the official state native fruit of Ohio, and so it's your duty as an Ohio citizen to come down <laughs> and have a good time. And there's a picture of a pawpaw. I wanted to just kind of squeeze them all. I had a couple Sarah Grant for pawpaw, so I figured this would be okay. And there's some goats, and so we're seasonal. We only milk the goats from like March till Thanksgiving, so we're getting ready to have a bunch of kids. And Sasha and Celeste, who work for us, they're here today, so you might run into them and talk about goats. And now, actually, I've become a county commissioner. So, like, I'm like, kind of like, this is my second year, so I'm kind of like, kind of like trying to let let go a little bit of the farm because I'm trying to do other stuff with like recycling and energy aggregation and and community involvement with politics. Um, so I'm like really relying on my my staff to to do a good job. And, and they are. That's great. That's it. Yes. Uh, you mentioned anaerobic. I do anaerobic fermentation, and I think the difference it tastes great. But I heard from uh, I used to probiotic jar and a maker who says that only there's only uh, anaerobic that you can use to it at the moment. So he had a comment about anaerobic uh, fermentation and how that might be most applicable for beets. Yes. Could you discuss uh, with the um, uh, state official, whatever, non lactic acid fermentations where you don't develop the low pH and the question was, is, did I talk to the ODA about non-lactic acid producing bacteria not getting a low pH? Uh, not really. Um, mostly when we were having this conversation with our inspector who didn't know anything, he called up to ODA offices and said, hey, we want, you know, this guy wants to make sauerkraut and stuff. What's that? How do we deal with this? And he said pH. So we never even talked about any other way of besides pH being a critical control point. The question was, is, do I use crops at all? And the answer is no, because I don't have any. And there, if I had some, I might, you know, and obviously there, I would say there would be a benefit of not using plastic. Um, and maybe in the future we might find a source of crops and, and go that way. But right now we're just using plastic. Yes. Hey, the question was: Is what kind of equipment do we use at our farmers market? Um, because this is a, is a refrigerated product, and see that cooler right there? That's yeah. that's all I use. Okay. Um, do you have to keep an office in there or anything, or is it? Yes, we're inspected at our market by our local health department and our health inspector will come around and gets her thermometer gun out and if she tests you you better be in the zone so and yes you do have to have a thermometer in each of your coolers so um, now not every place in Ohio is going to be regulated the same um, we've got a very sympathetic to small farmers uh, health inspector um, other counties I know are requiring you have plugged in refrigeration. Unfortunately, even though Athens County, we have one of the best farmers markets in the state, we don't have that kind of infrastructure. That's one of the things that we're working on, trying to get our permanent location together. Yes, sir. The question was, is have we ever tried any fermented pawpaw products? And yeah, we did. We tried some sodas, and they were pretty bad. <laughs> We, we did a spice bush berry um, fermented beverage, which didn't turn out too bad. So um, we did a lot of experimenting, and the, the pop pop, it's tough. I mean, it's challenging enough on its own. So, yes. have, you, have you done the kombucha and then, and then uh, the second fermentation, adding pop pop to that to make? 
okay, the question was, is have I done the kombucha and then in the secondary fermentation added the, uh, um, the pawpaw? And I've done the kombucha at home, but I never added pawpaw to it. But yeah, if I ever had less things to do, I might try that. <laughs> The question was, is do we rely on just naturally occurring lactic acid producing bacteria or do we inoculate it with some other stuff? And most of the time we're just relying on uh, naturally occurring stuff. We, because we have the cheese and we've got whey, we have incorporated the whey a couple times. Um, sorry about that. Um, because we're a goat dairy and goat whey is kind of goaty, um, you know, that can be a turnoff for goat phobic people. So um, we've tended to not rely on whey as a, a, you know, it happens naturally at the right temperature on its own. Yes? When you pickle tomatoes, do you peel them first or do you pickle them whole? Okay, the question was is when we're doing tomatoes, do we do them whole or do we peel them first? And we just do them whole. Um, well, those were just like maybe we cut off the top or we just had, you know, like maybe there's a bad spot or something. So most of the time, let me see here. But you're not like cutting them to let the brine get in or like they'll get through the shit now. Right. We don't cut them until we're turning them into salsa. So it's actually a really fast way to preserve your tomatoes. You've got a place to store them in a cooler. And so all you variety of tomatoes stack the same when you do it? We've used any old kind of tomato. We haven't done a lot of like experimenting with this or that. A lot of these are like slicers and they work fine. They work really great. The question was is do we add the oak leaves or grape leaves to the tomatoes and no we don't. All right, so you guys want to try some of this fermented food before we run out of time. Uh, come on up here, grab a plate and sample away and thank you for coming.